Uh, hi, this is David, and welcome to part 7 of the Basics of Game Theory. Today we're going to talk more about bluff sizing, bluff frequency, and a little bit more on polarized ranges. Now, when you have a game and you're betting, and you're considering value bets and bluffs, somebody may ask themselves, well, how frequently should I bluff? Uh, what size bet should I make when I bluff? And things such as that. Now, if we look at the game that uh, we were playing before, the one card poker game where player one draws one of these four cards and player two is bet a jack, high card wins. Remember that we gave player one the option of either making a bet or folding, and player two has the option of just calling the bet or folding. Okay? Now, if we're playing a game where the bet sizes are restricted and you don't have any choice over bet sizes, then the frequency with which you make the optimal bluff is mandated directly by that pot size, by that bet size. Suppose our only option here is to make a pot size bet of $2. Okay, when we bet 2 to win 2, we create a $4 pot, which our opponent must put in $2 to call. When our opponent calls 2, he stands to win 4. He's getting 2 to 1 on his money. Since we're offering pot odds of 2 to 1, we should have two value bets for each bluff. Okay, but suppose we're playing a game that's a, it's a no-limit game. Where we have, where we can bet a dollar if we want, or we could bet up to a hundred dollars. We could bet any amount that we want. When that's the case, the bigger the bet size that we choose, the more frequently we can bluff. Now, our ratio of bluffs to value bets can never exceed one to one. We can never have more bluffs than value bets. And the reason for that is no matter how big that we bet, we can never offer our opponent worse than one to one. Okay? Uh, even if, suppose there were no pot here at all, and we were betting a million dollars. Well, still, our opponent would be calling a million to win a million. Okay? We, there is no way we can give him worse than one-to-one -one on his money, so therefore we must always have at least a one-to-one -one ratio of value bets to bluffs, one bluffing optimally in these uh, situations, primarily heads-up situations of uh, flop. Now, when we look at this, Suppose we bet half pot. When we bet half pot, we're betting one to win two. We, we create a pot of three units. Okay? Our opponent must call one unit, the size of our, in order to win three. That's when we would bet one dollar to win two dollars. Okay? Well, we're offering him three to one pot odds. We must have three value bets for each bluff. Okay? So hopefully this should be pretty easy for us now. And if you ever get confused, like say you're betting 1.5 1, 1. times pot, you're betting 3 to win 2. When you're betting 3 into the $2 pot, you create a pot of $5. Your opponent must call 3 to win 5. So your ratio of value bets to bluffs uh, should be 5 to 3. So don't ever get confused and think, well, it's 5 to 3. Does that mean 5 bluffs or 5 value bets? The bigger number is always the value bets because you can never have... You, you can never be giving your opponent more than one to one on his money, so you have, always have to have at least one value bet per bluff in these situations. So if you're betting 1.5 times a pot and offering your opponent uh, five for his $3 call, then you should have five value bets for each three bluffs. Okay, now let's look at things from a defensive point of view. Okay? From the defensive point of view, uh, when we, we use the min-max system, we minimize our opponent's maximum win against us. And the way we do this is we look at the pot odds that he's being offered uh, by the pot for his bluff. For instance, if the opponent, we're talking about well, we're player two here. When the opponent bets $2 or makes a full pot bet, he's betting one to win. He's getting one to one on his money. Okay. He needs a 50, us to fold 50% before he crosses his break-even threshold. So we can call 50% of the time and keep him from making money. Okay? If we folded more than 50% of the time, he would be making money. Now, as I said previously, uh, when, he, when we have a big range of hands, uh, and say it includes mostly value hands and bluffs, then the bigger our opponent bets at us or raises us when we bet, the better it is for us. Okay, uh, we don't have to defend as frequently. 
when he makes a bet, say he's betting twice pot, he's betting four to win two. Okay, since he's only getting paid one to two, we only need to call one third of the time. Okay, that helps us because we don't have the pressure of calling as much to keeping them honest, and we only need to have one third value bets in our range. But that's not true when we have a medium strength band. When we have a polarized range like he does here, and he's attacking us, the bigger the bets are, the better it is for the polarized range. And I demonstrated that before. Uh, suppose we take the case where he's making betting one to win one. Okay, he makes 50 value bets, 25 bets, bluffs, 25 folds, and he comes out $150 net ahead per 100 hands, whether the opponent is always calling or folding, regardless of his strategy. Uh, but we also showed that when our opponent is betting bigger, say he's betting four to win two, he wins more money. Okay, when he's when he's making their bet, and it doesn't matter what strategy player two adopts, uh, the bigger bets from the polarized range are going to make more money. We're giving this player difficult decisions. Sometimes he'll be making other uh, incorrect folds. Sometimes he'll make, be making incorrect calls. But when the big money starts going in, the player with polarized range has the big advantage. Okay. Now suppose player two was the one with the polarized range. We're going to keep the game almost the same. Uh, but what we're going to do here is we're going to say that player two draws from one of these four cards. So player one is either going to have a 10 or a queen, and player two is either going to have a two or an ace. Okay, this is the situation we want as player two, when we're betting or when we're defending. We have a polarized range, so it's very difficult for us to make a mistake. The bigger the bets are, the more it favors the polarized range, and the more it hurts the medium strength hands. Previously, when we had a jack, player one had the benefit of having a polarized range. He's the one that benefits from the big bets going in. Okay? But when we have the polarized range, now he has medium strength hands. Okay? The more money that goes in, the better it is for us. He bets a million dollars here. Fantastic. We're going to fold our twos. We're going to call with our aces. Absolutely no way that the medium strength hands is going to come out on top when the big money starts going in. It always favors the medium, the, uh, the polarized range. Now, what we can take from this in poker is that when you have a medium strength hand, like a one pair hand, top pair, and over pair, uh, if your opponent shows any activity at all, what you should do is try to play pot control and get to show down cheaply because you don't want to be folding good hands that have a chance to, to win, and sometimes you're going to be forced to. When money starts going in heavily, the polarized range is going to continue with his value hands and fold his bluff hands. And the bigger the, bigger the bets come, become, the more it just values here. The, the, you know, the more player two gets more value from it. So we're going to remember this when we're constructing our pre-flop ranges. We're going to remember this when we're bluffing and playing uh, post-flop. We're going to remember this with our bet sizes. And we're going to remember this most of all when we have the medium strength hands in our range and the bets start getting heavy. Okay? This is when the, the medium strength hands want to play pot control and then the polarized ranges want to really start pushing Okay, you can push these medium strength hands around with your polarized range, put them to difficult decisions, make them make incorrect calls uh, when you're strong, make them make incorrect folds when you're weak, and you'll never be faced with a difficult decision because when they play back at you, you're either going to have a very strong hand that welcomes the money, or a very weak hand from which you can easily uh, get away, just throw it away. Anyway, that's going to be all for right now. Uh, part 8, we're going to continue a little bit more on this and look at some uh, pre-flop action and hold them. That's all.